I'd like to welcome everybody here today. I want to thank you for coming, and I know that there's reasons why you're here. The problem of same-sex attraction seems to be growing every year. There are new laws regarding same-sex attraction. There are new regulations in the government stating that we cannot discriminate, we cannot do anything that's going to offend people who claim that they are living in the gay lifestyle and we as a people have a message to give. So what I'd like to do is give you an overview of all the situations and all the problems that are coming and what we can do about them as a church family, as a group, and as individuals. This is going to be a six-part series. We're going to talk about people who are involved. So one passage is going to be to the parents of the children that come to them and say, hey, I'm gay. Another section is going to be the pastors. Pastors have the duty of listening when somebody comes and says, Pastor, I'm gay. What do I do? The scripture says I'm lost. I'm going to hell. What do I do? Most pastors don't have much training in what to do. The training that they have is send them to a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Well, that's not perhaps the best answer for the pastor or the church. But the church has a problem also. What does the church do when somebody comes and says, I'm gay? Do they allow him to come into the church? Do they allow him to uh, go where the children are? Do they allow him to have any contact with people outside of the small group? Do they say, we love you as a sinner, but we hate your sin? What's the answer to those problems? And what do you tell the young person who comes and says, Pastor, I'm gay. I don't know where I got these feelings. I don't know how I got these feelings. Everybody says I can't change, but I'm not happy where I am. I don't like these feelings. What does the pastor say? What do you as individual members say? What is the correct answer to give in those situations? So we're going to delve into the problem and find out what it is. The real problem. Now the real problem is, I think, we don't understand where the person is coming from. Well, a lot of us don't understand. I understand because I was there for 25 years. I grew up in the lifestyle. I lived the lifestyle. I was also married. I was also a teacher of a school and a principal. I led two distinctly separate and I had all the heartache and all the fear and all the rejection that comes with suddenly discovering that you're gay. It's a real problem for the young person coming up. First of all, he feels he's gay. So we're talking internal perceptions. Inside, he knows what he likes. I once had a pastor come to me and say, well, you couldn't possibly enjoy sex the same being gay as you are straight. But what the pastor didn't understand was the hard wiring of my system was exactly the same as his, except the attraction button was on the male side. He didn't understand that. And so he said, you couldn't possibly, but I could possibly. I understood everything the way he understood it, except for me, it was to the male side and not the female side. My internal perception said I was gay. Now, at first, I didn't even have a word for it. Gay is an interesting term, you know, it came about in the last few years, few decades. It's not something that just happens to you. <coughs> gay is a term that has taken on a new meaning because there are a group of people that say, well, this is a lifestyle. Well, when I first started, it wasn't a lifestyle. It was the way I was, the way I felt I was. And they told me that once you're that way, you're always that way. But then I read in the Bible, these people have a real problem. God doesn't seem to like them. God doesn't like the lifestyle that they're living. 
At least that's the way I read it. And I knew that I was going to go to hell because I was in a church that taught that if you're that way, you're going to hell. And then the pastor said, well, just get married. Oh, that was a good answer. Get married. Sure, you take a person who has no physical attraction toward females and say, get married. What do you have? A person that still has no attraction to females. It doesn't solve the problem. In fact, what it does is compound the problem because the person that you marry usually has a need of their own that needs a very passive person to marry them. Now, if you change, now you have another problem. The problem is that if you change, the person you're living with isn't married to the same person. She now has an aggressive partner. She now has someone that's going to stand up and talk against <coughs> the things that she believes. He's going to defy in certain ways. She's going to interpret it as defiance because you're just not going along with it. So, you have some real problems here. The biggest problem that I had when I was growing up is nobody talked about it. Nobody even had an idea how to handle it. And so there I was. I was stuck. I was living a double life. On one hand, I wanted to be God's child. I wanted to be the perfect school teacher. I wanted to be the perfect you name it. The problem was, on the other hand, I had urges that came that I knew were wrong. I was addicted to pornography very early in life. I was molested very early in life. I had all the classic symptoms of what the problem of homosexuality is and what causes it. And I just felt normal to me. Normal. But my normal is not or was not God's normal. But I had a problem. How do you handle that situation? How do you take care of a problem that you can't define, that you don't know how you got? Who do you blame for it if there is blame to be given? How do you know what you can do to help the person involved? The reason I'm going on like this is simply to let you know that this is not a problem that is easily solved. And it's a problem that to the person involved in it is so real that he thinks it is an inbred part of himself or herself. It's in there. And there's nothing they can do to change it. And so I started in life. First memories of my life were having attractions in that direction, having abuse, having distant from my father, having a whole lot of problems that nobody understood was going to turn me in a given direction, but we're told by the current psychologist, psychiatrist, that gender identification isn't totally formed until you're several years old. It's a developing thing, and anything on that scale of development changes what you're going to end up liking. We're told that men are visual, men see things. The stimulation that comes to a man will form what he is. And so if he starts out in the wrong mode and sees the wrong thing, hears the wrong thing, his mind is liable to make decisions on those things, and you're going to find out that you are uh, drawn in a given direction. All of this is an extremely hard situation to handle. It was just a lack of knowledge. We didn't know. We didn't have information. At the end of these tapes, I'm going to give you a CD that has all of the references to the major organizations where you can get help and get information. The best psychologists, the best psychiatrists, and there is argument amongst them all. Everybody thinks that his way is the right way. I'm not up here to say my way is the only way. What I'm up here to say is God has an answer for the problem. So when it comes to knowledge, knowledge has increased greatly on how change happens and it has changed greatly on the fact that it is now proven and understood and believed by a lot of people that change is possible. But how does the church 
handle it? How does the pastor handle it? How does the parent handle it? How does the person involved in it have enough courage to come forth and say, I've got this thing in me and I don't know what it is? When the whole world outside is saying, hey, well, if you've got these feelings, go act them out. Go try them. They're okay. It's almost a hidden agenda that's been going on in this country. It's an illusion of normalcy. Everybody on the lifestyle side of the gay world wants to create an illusion that they are normal. They want everybody to say, poor, poor you. You were abused. You grew up. That's the way you are. You're the way you are because that's the way you are and you can't change it. I suggest to you that there is an answer to those problems. There is an answer to the illusion of normalcy. I use the word illusion because no matter how normal the gay lifestyle appears, it's still an illusion. It's not real. Now they have everything that we have. They want everything that we want. They have a plan to get everything in perspective to change everything so that they can be what they feel that they are and it still doesn't fit the scriptural background. In fact, why bother? That was a question that I faced very early in life. Why even bother? If this is the way you are, why don't you just go do it? Well, there's a few reasons that we wouldn't want to do that. Number one, very early in life I had read in scripture that this was wrong. And I had enough knowledge by the time I was 10 years old to read a, a, a text in 1 Corinthians 6 and 19 that says that the liar and the thief and the gossip and the and the homosexual will not inherit eternal life. I, I was strong enough to read that. And then I read the next line. It says, and such were some of you. So my brain clicked and said, wait a minute. These people, all of these sins in this list, and it was a list. And it wasn't one on the list more important than another on the list. The liar, the thief, the gossip, the whatever, adulterer, you name it, you know the list just as well as I do. Everything on that list was summed up in the final sentence that says, and such were some of you, but ye are cleansed, ye are clean, ye are changed, ye are sanctified, ye are loved, ye are accepted, ye are part of God's family. And suddenly it dawned on me, well, if homosexuality is part of that list, and they were changed, then change must be possible. But everybody was saying you can't do it. Now at age 10 I didn't go into all that theory, I just read the text, I just read the verse, I knew what was going on in the verse. And I knew that I had something that I didn't want. So what could I do? I said, God, if you're real, you need to do something about this. Actually, I came home one night. I was about 14. There was a Bible study going on in my home. People were talking to me. People were showing pictures on the wall, having all of these wonderful Bible truths out there. And my mind picked up on the fact that the Bible says that it was predicted a certain time that Christ would come at a certain time and there would be length of prophecy. And I caught this instantly. I wanted to know if this was true. If God could say something 400 years ahead of time, then he surely knew what was going to happen to me. And there might be an answer here. So that night I said, God, if you will take me, just like I am, and show me if you are real, I would love to be yours. Next day, the door rang, the doorbell rang. Police came to the door. Now, let me insert here. My parents did not know anything that was going on in my life. I had become a professional liar, perfectionist liar. I knew how to cover up everything that I did, but I was the kind of kid that the other parents didn't want their kids to play with. Because I wasn't just involved in the foolishness that goes on in childhood. I was the leader of some of it. So the doorbell rang and the police came. 
and they said, your son has got to go before the judge Thursday. My parents were petrified. They didn't know what they'd done. They didn't know how to handle it. They had no concept of what to do, except they knew that they had to go before the judge and explain why I was doing what I was doing. And they didn't even know I was doing it. Thursday came. Of course, they told me that I had to go to court, juvenile court. I was worried, totally afraid, as a matter of fact. But I had said, God, if you want me to change, you've got to change something. Well, you know, it's a fact that if nothing changes, nothing changes. If you allow yourself to stay in the same situation with the same people and the same attitudes and the same habits and the same thoughts, nothing will change. And God proved that to me beyond a shadow of a doubt because he just brought the police to the front door. I went into the court. Didn't say a word. My options were this. I would go to state reform school. I would stay there until I was 18 because I was one of these kids that was getting into more trouble than the judge would allow. I thought, I'm dead for sure. And then this little lady stood up in the front row and she said, Your Honor, we have another system. Our church has a system of Christian boarding schools and we can remove this boy from this area and this temptation and put him into this Christian boarding school and he can start a new life. And the judge said, okay, first of all I want him tested. Send him to a psychiatric hospital and get him tested. And it's come out that he is able to function in the real world you can send him to this Christian boarding school, and that was the sentence. I was sentenced to Christian boarding school. And everybody was shocked. Me, particular. I'd never been to a Christian boarding school. I didn't know what it was about. All I know was, I didn't have to go to state reform school. And that was a blessing. So the next day, I found myself in a car heading down into the area around Massachusetts and sitting in the office of a psychiatrist who gave me all kinds of tests. These were wonderful tests, weird tests. And when it was all said and done, the results were, yeah, he's got a problem. He's got a big problem. He doesn't have the proper gender identification. Big word, gender identification. In other words, I didn't know if I was a boy or a girl. But I leaned toward being a girl. But the psychiatrist also said it's very possible that he would do well in this school. So go ahead and send him. Sunday morning came. I had spent three days, Thursday, Friday, well, actually Friday, Saturday, starting on Sunday, left the hospital. By the way, if you've never been in a, hosp a psychiatric hospital as an inpatient, you don't want to go. Everybody there is crazy, except you. And they're all weird, except you. Except my test said I was too. But that's how they handle it back then. Sunday morning, I end up at the principal's office of the Christian boarding school. Now remember, I believe that if somebody found out that you had this problem, God said you were going straight to hell. I remember the principal. I'm not going to give you his name. We had a very fond acronym of it. It was LSD. He was a wonderful guy. Stood about five feet tall, big black rim glasses, gray hair, gray suit, sitting behind this huge oak desk with a file in front of him about that big, and I knew that file was me. And he looked stern. And I thought, I'm gone for sure. There's no way he's going to accept me here. And that principal of the Christian boarding school reached over on his left side and he opened the drawer of his desk and he picked up my file and he put it in that drawer and he said, if you don't open that drawer, I won't. Welcome to our school. Wow. God is good. 
I couldn't believe it. I was off the hook. Now, I'm not sure how putting a gay male child in a dormitory with 75 boys that all took gang showers was exactly a cure, but I had a chance. And he wasn't going to open the drawer if I didn't, and I said, Lord, I will not open that drawer. I'm going to bury this thing. And I did for five years. More than five years, actually. And I did well at school. But that's not the whole story. You see, I had said, God, if you're real, you show me. So God brought the police, knocked on the door, picked me up, set me down in Christian boarding school in a space of three days. That afternoon, that Sunday afternoon, I went out for dinner. And I went to the home of this lady that had stood up in court for me. Her sister lived in that town. We went out to her house for dinner. And I'll never forget it. It was a most interesting place. Japanese motif, everybody sat on pillows on the floor and ate off a table that was about three feet high, two feet high. I'm sitting there getting ready for lunch, and in walks a very tall man. Must have been at least six foot three. Gray hair, gray mustache, deep voice. He comes over, and I remember thinking, now how is he going to unfold that frame in this table so he can eat. But he did it. He sat down and he sat down beside me. And we started talking. He asked me where I was from, what my history was. I lied. Didn't tell him much of anything. Actually, I bluffed my way through. I'm going to the academy over here. Everything's great. I'm, you know, lie. Everything wasn't great, but it was better than it was before. And then he said, I would like to give you something. God told me that I should give you something, and that got my attention. Because when God tells people something, I sometimes look at them like, okay, God's talking to you. He reached in his pocket and he pulled out a business card. And on the business card was printed Philippians 1.6. And he said, I don't know your story, young man, but I know God wants you to have this. Well, Philippians 1.6 says, He that hath begun a good work in you will finish it. And I thought, God, not only did you bring me down here and change my life, you sent me a note, written, that you're going to finish what you started in me. Not one feeling had changed in my life. Not one attraction had diminished. But God said if he began something in you, he was going to finish it. And I maintain that every person that is living in the gay lifestyle today, every young person that's facing this issue, has the same text to rely upon. If God starts something in you, he will finish it. Now how do you know if he started something in you? That's very simple. You're sitting here today. You're looking at this tape. You're hearing this word. Because if you're here, God got you here somehow. He pulled the strings. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And he drew you to this room for this word right now. Parents, he drew you to this room because your child has a problem that you don't know how to solve. But God has started something in him, and God is going to finish something in him. And he started something in you, and he's going to finish the same thing in you. Because this isn't just a single person thing. God is in charge of all the finishing, of all the problems. But you say, I can't change, I don't feel any different, I don't want to feel any different. If you don't want to feel any different, look out, God's going to touch you. And you're going to want to change. I remember the day I tried to kill myself. I wanted to change and I couldn't seem to have accomplished it. This was far down the road. But remember, he that began will finish and there's a time frame in the middle and there's growth in the middle. A huge amount of growth in the middle. All of those problems that my life had for baggage had to be solved. And you couldn't solve them all at one time. And the principal of the academy knew that. So he said, look, let's put this problem in the drawer. Let's get you trained first. Let's get you underway. Parents, the same problem is going to happen to you. The same thing is going to happen to you. Your child has a problem, but you also have a problem. No parent wants to hear Mike's son comes in and says, I'm gay. Why, that's his problem. That's not my problem. 
Well, he's living with you. But you're not to blame. You've just got the result of a problem. And God says, if I begin something in you, I'm going to finish it in you. Not only am I going to save your son or daughter who's living in the gay lifestyle, I'm going to save you. So that you can all be together with me. And that's a tall order. But God said, I'm going to do it. He said, I'm going to teach you how to relate to this child with all the problems. All right, let's take the word the gay out of it. Let's take gay out of it completely. Suppose your son turns out to be an alcoholic. You'll deal with that problem. Suppose he turns out to be a thief. You'll deal with that problem. Suppose he turns out to be a drug addict. You'll deal with that problem. Suppose he becomes pornography addicted. He'll deal with that problem and you'll deal with the effects of it. And so will his wife, his children, and so will your children, your family. But God said, He that hath begun a good work in you, which is God, will finish the problem. He'll take care of it. In fact, I'll tell you a secret. He already has taken care of the problem. The problem is solved completely already because when Christ died on the cross, the last words out of his mouth before he said, God, take my spirit, he said, it is finished. Well, what was finished? My lying, my thievery, my addiction, my drug addiction, my homosexuality, my perversion. It's all finished at the cross. And God said, if you will allow me to finish this work in you, we'll all go home and we'll all be happy. And right about now you're saying it's too simple. It can't work that way. Well, it does. And I'm going to tell you how over the next few tapes it's going to finish that way. God will reach down and will touch you completely and change you. All right, let's shift off of this just a little bit. Who's to blame for a child having same-sex attractions? Now, the parents feel like, what did I do wrong? That's what my mother said the first time. The police walked in the door said, your son has this problem. He's going to court. She said, what did I do? What did, where did I go wrong? She didn't have a clue. I was looking at myself and said, what did I do wrong? I feel perfectly normal. What's wrong with... It's, it's normal for me. Where did I go? Who can I blame? Well, maybe I can blame the man that caught me when I was very young and taught me things that no boy should ever be taught. And experimented on me and did things with me. So that by the time I was five or six years old, I was bent in a given direction already. It was already there first thoughts I had were male attraction because I'd been taught that. Maybe it was a blame of the person that I remember being physically beaten by. Who's to blame for the problem? Or is there a blame? We're going to explore that possibility also. We're going to find out who actually is to blame with the problem that you're having with same-sex attraction. And once you find out who's to blame, you're going to be able to clear the air. And once you clear the air, you can begin to go. You know there's a text in the Bible that says, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free? But what's the truth? The truth is the opposite of a lie. In fact, if I don't recognize that there is a lie, I don't know that there is any truth. Think about that for just a minute. I believed I was attracted to the same sex. And I believed that maybe it was born in me. Well, was it? All studies prove that there's no genetic marker for a gay child. There are certain tendencies that you might have, but they're not going to make the decision for you. They're not going to make it impossible for you to change. So you weren't born that way. What about the environment? What about where I live? Yes, I lived in a place where some of this stuff went on. Most people didn't know anything about it. My parents didn't know anything about it for 10 years, 14 years. But it was there. Was it the environment that changed me? Might have been. Or was it something else? Something that was more 
in cities? We're going to answer that question later on. Is there a possibility that by discovering the lie, we can examine the truth? In fact, is there any possibility of change for a person who will not acknowledge that there may be a problem in his existence? There are several diseases in the psychiatric field that have one common base. The person that has them doesn't think they're sick. And if you don't think you're sick, and everything is normal to you, you won't go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a pastor or anything to take care of those problems because you're not sick. But the truth is, you are sick. Once you begin to acknowledge that the sickness exists, you can begin to have a clue as to how to solve the sickness. The rest of these tapes is going to be an explanation of the truth, an examination of the truth, a discovery of how a person can actually change and have his lifestyle change, have his orientation change, whatever word you want to use, have his attraction changed, and come in full relationship with his family and with his God. That's the promise that I put out to you. If we finish this series of tapes, if you will look at this series, we'll examine each of those problems in order. And remember, I look at it from a perspective that you can't look at it from. Because 30 years ago, I was living in that perspective. Now I'm 60 plus years old. I can go back and say that for 30 years, God has totally freed me up from anything that has to do with this problem. They say, well, don't you have inclinations? Don't you have desires? Aren't you, are you just repressing? All good questions, and we're going to get to the answers in time. But I just wanted you to know that I come from a perspective of having been there. Now, it's interesting that God deals with us in a very specific manner. Jesus says, you've sinned. And the Bible said the remedy for sin has to be a Savior. But what kind of a Savior? In the book of John it says, in the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwell among us. Jesus came down here and examined and lived our lifestyle. Then there's another text that says, There is no temptation come to you except as is common to man, but God is willing that with the temptation, He's going to make a way of escape. Jesus came down here and lived for you. He came down here and he took part of you. And he took part of me. And the part he took was all the sin. Do you think he doesn't understand me? The text says he can be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. He knows where we've been. He feels the rejection we have felt. The principle is this. If you want to help somebody, you might want to become acquainted with the way he is. Learn about him. Learn about your son, your daughter. Learn about your parents. Learn about anybody that's dealing with you. You become a bright light to them. The first alcoholics that ever changed, that started Alcoholics Anonymous, were facing a problem that said, if you don't stop drinking, you will die of dementia, or cirrhosis of the liver, or something else, but it'll be a horrible death. And for a hundred years, people were dying that way, and nobody said you can change. But these two guys got together. 
And they discover the principles of the gospel that I'm going to be presenting to you over the next few weeks. The next few tapes. And they discovered that by helping each other, they understood each other. Because an alcoholic can't lie to an alcoholic. An alcoholic can come into his family and say, I haven't drunk today. <clears throat> and the alcoholic will look at him and say, Ha! Who are you trying to kid? I know where you've been and what you've done because I've been there and done that. Jesus has been here and done this. He has experienced our problems. I'm not saying he was gay. But I'm saying he's experienced the rejection, he's experienced the trauma, he's experienced the love of God that kept him from falling into all of these temptations. Jesus said, of my own self, I do nothing. He did not depend upon himself to get through the human experience. He did what his father showed him to do and told him to do. And so we do the same thing. Is it possible to change from gay to straight? I'm standing up here and saying, I was there and now I'm here. And if you will listen to the principles that we'll lay out for you in the next few tapes, you can have been there and you can come over here. And victory is assured because Jesus said it is finished. He that hath begun a good work in you will finish it. It's going to happen. It happened to me. I can tell you miracle after miracle after miracle of wonderful things that happen in the midst of trial and trial and trial and trial. But God stepped in and turned all of that around. And I'm still growing today. I want to thank you for being patient with me. I invite you to explore what's in the rest of this series of tapes because it will have an answer for you if you're caught in one of these traps that the devil has set for you. God bless you all.